morning. Welcome again to Peachtree and happy Father's Day to all of the dads. We are so glad that you're joining us, whether you're here in the sanctuary or joining us online. Now, a number of years ago, I had a favorite college professor who was a classic study professor who taught an area on one of the more obscure courses, or it was a course on one of the more obscure areas of Greek and Roman religion. It was about the mystery cults and the magic that permeated the understanding of the Roman Empire. Now, that course taught me a whole lot about, Paul's un about what went underlied Paul's epistles and exactly what he faced while he was planting the churches throughout the Roman Empire. But what I remember the most about this class were two phrases that the professor shared with us on the first day. When we walked in on the blackboard was written, confusion is good. And then as we started to go through the syllabus, the professor said, if you don't leave this class with a headache, I haven't done my job right. Now that last statement was one that he definitely lived up to. I went through a whole lot of Advil during the course of that semester, but it was the former statement, that first one that really struck with me, stuck with me, confusion is good. And it made sense as the professor began to unpack it throughout the course of the semester. He said that when we were confused, we would start to ask the good questions. The questions that would make us delve deep into understanding what we needed to know and to find the answers that we needed. Now, about five years ago, I was working with a couple on planning their wedding. We had gone through the easy parts of the premarital counseling. We'd figured out what goes into making a happy marriage. And then we were into the difficult part, planning the wedding service itself. And as we had everything nearly nailed down, one night I got an email from the bride. She'd recently been at a wedding and she had a question about their vows after being at this wedding. So this wedding, they ended the vows with not the traditional until death do us part, but an into eternity. And this bride wanted to ensure that her wedding vows were done in a way that was the most biblically correct. So emails went back and forth. I offered to sit down and meet with the couple for a while, but we figured it all out by email. And it all centered around a passage from Matthew 22, beginning with verse 23 that I'd invite you to read with me now. The same day, Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses said if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and having no offspring left his wife to his brother. So to the second and the third down to the seventh. After them all, the, wife, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Please pray with me. May the same Holy Spirit that inspired the writing and preservation of these words inspire them for us today. Now this interaction between Jesus and the Sadducees is one of those that some of us sort of scratch our head over at first. It seems like out of nowhere, a group of people come up to Jesus and ask him a question that feels as though it makes absolutely no sense, which is why it's important for us to understand just what was happening here. Jesus' teachings had been noticed. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had noticed him. They noticed that the people were listening to Jesus and they weren't real happy about it. And so at this point in history, the spiritual leadership between, of the Jewish people had become firmly cemented in two different sects, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they had issues with Jesus' teaching. So they wanted to find ways to poke holes in Jesus' teaching. But we have to understand more about these two sects to really understand what was going on here. The Pharisees tended to focus their teaching and their understanding of Scripture on what we can often describe as a legalistic approach to scripture. They wanted to ensure that every letter of the 613 laws of Moses, the 613 mitzvahs, could be understood and followed as closely as humanly possible. 
And they did that by looking at those laws that all occur in what's called the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. And then they would look at how those laws could be taken in reading the rest of the Old Testament. And that's how they taught. And because of this particular understanding of Scripture, the Pharisees believed in an afterlife, and they looked toward the resurrection with great hope. But the Sadducees took a very different slant. They were nearly all of the priestly class, descendants of Aaron, and they read the Bible solely as basing all of their theology from that Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And because of how the words of Scripture appear in those books, they did not believe in an afterlife. And they firmly rejected the idea of the resurrection, which was why they asked Jesus the particular question that they did. Now this question comes to us from one of those parts of Deuteronomy that, let's be honest, we tend to skip over when we're reading through the Bible. I'd like to share with you the words that are from the 25th chapter. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must, marry, must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. That the first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she'll go to the elders at the town gate and say, my husband's brother refuses to carry out his duty as a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of the town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I don't want to marry her, his brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face, and say, this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. <laughs> Makes me very glad I'm wearing shoes that can't be pulled off and that my brother is happily with two children. I love his, my, my sister-in-law, but I did not want to marry her. Now, the idea behind this commandment that we're given, which is called leverate marriage, was to ensure that inheritance would follow the proper lines as understood at the time. By having the oldest son through this marriage be considered the heir of his deceased brother. But it also ensured protection to the widow that she would have a family that would care for her, would support her. And that was needed at the time. Now, while this mitzvah was not given until Deuteronomy, we can see an early case in Genesis when it was called for, when Judah's son Ur dies childless, and his brother Onan then marries the widow. He too dies childless. But then Judah, the dad, refused to offer his third son, Shelah, to Tamar, forcing her to take matters into her own hands, which we're not going to talk about today. This is a family program, after all. But this goes to show us that Jesus and all of those present at this, for this confrontation between him and the Sadducees were familiar with the question that was being presented to him. They understood leverate marriage. But we have to remember something again about the Sadducees. It's something that Matthew felt was so important that he mentions it at the beginning of this question. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. So their question to Jesus is as much about seeking to disprove the resurrection, as it is trying to disprove Jesus' ability as a teacher and as a threat to their own power. So we have to remember that what's happening in this passage isn't happening in isolation. Because this is the second in a series of three questions that Jesus is being asked. First, the Pharisees asked Jesus whether it's proper to pay taxes to the Romans. I preached that on tax day one time and it did not go so well. And then this question is posed, and then fall, the Pharisees decide to try to rebut the, the Sadducees by asking, which commandment is the greatest in all of them? So we're basically seeing the majority of this chapter is the Pharisees and the Sadducees playing off each other and off Jesus in a game of what can best be described as stump the Messiah. So we need to see, though, what are the Sadducees asking? The oldest of seven brothers dies childless after being married, and according to the mitzvah of leverate marriage, his brother, one of his brothers needs to step up to the plate and do what's right. Ultimately, all six other brothers die childless. And then the widow. And the Sadducees want to know, whose wife is this woman when the resurrection occurs? 
Now, most of us look at that question and we go, this has about as much impact on our lives as that great age-old theological pondering of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It's a question that doesn't truly need an answer, and it can be debated on for years on end without ever finding one. But Jesus immediately answers the question. You are wrong, because you know neither the scripture nor the power of God. Those words would have been, well, a slap in the face to the Sadducees, claiming that the religious elite, that the priests themselves do not understand scripture or the power of the Almighty Lord. So Jesus continues by explaining that in the resurrection, people are not married, but rather like angels in heaven. Now, whenever I read those words, I feel like I have to pause and unpack them a little bit because they become some of the most misconstrued words of the gospel. As Jesus is, not, is saying that those who have been resurrected are like angels in heaven, has given rise to the view that we become angels in heaven. And so my mind immediately turns to this particular comic from the far side, which I miss greatly. This is not what Jesus is saying. We do not die, go to heaven, and are immediately handed a halo, wings, and a harp, or go the other way and are immediately handed an accordion, though I'll leave it up to the music staff to decide our harps or accordions better and more godly. <laughs> Rather, we become like the angels in heaven. For the job of the angels was to be the hands and feet of the Lord, and the root of that word angel means a messenger. We are to be, God, be like God's messengers. Now again, we have to look at that difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, because the Pharisees believed in angels. They believed in spirits. They believed that the angels were at work and active in the world, while the Sadducees' reading of scripture made them believe that angels did not exist. So we have to see in Jesus' words to the Sadducees, another little poke towards them, another reminder that he knew exactly to whom he was speaking and what words he could use that would answer their question in a way that would be proper and satisfying not only to them, but to all of those who were hearing them. Now I say that not to say that Jesus was uh, dropping himself down to play into the game of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It, he did not want to be involved in this one-upmanship, but rather that Jesus knew the words that, and the people that he was talking to. He knew what should be said in a way that would reach them and reach us where we are. In the resurrection, they will be like angels in heaven. We will be like angels in heaven, which meant for, that for those who were listening to Jesus' answer, they heard him reinforcing two different things. First, the angels exist, which was again one of those nice points where he was playing towards the crowd a bit to reinforce the view of what he knew was true. But also, he wanted us to realize a bigger piece of the resurrection. We will be like angels. Our focus, our concern will stop being about the things of this world, about to whom we are married or have been married. And it becomes focused on living completely for God. I think it's easiest for us to hear those words and to understand them that we will be like angels in heaven in the context of some words from the Sermon on the Mount that Rich shared with us back in February. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of their life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly fathers knows what you need. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In the resurrection, these seven brothers and their wife 
And all of us will not be anxious about tomorrow. We will not be anxious about today. We will be able to solely focus our, our new life on worship and service of God. And that's what we were actually created for. There was a story I came across in another class, and you've probably realized I took some really strange classes in college about a group of priests who went to a barbarian tribe in medieval Europe to teach them the gospel. Now, the elders of this tribe questioned the priests about what the afterlife would look like, as this tribe believed that if they should die in battle, they would be rewarded by feasting in paradise for all eternity, which sounded pretty good to them. But the priests described the resurrection to them as a time when they would know the one oneness of God for all eternity. They would live in worship of God for all eternity. And that's the image that we need to remember. It's the image that we need to hold in the back of our mind, or we can think of it in a different way. As John wrote at the end of Revelation, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. It was God's intention when he created Adam out of the dust and then created Eve out of his rib that we would live in that way. It was God's hope and dream was that humanity would be able to live in the paradise that he had made for us. But that wasn't the way that things turned out. We know what happened after God breathed life into his first human creations. Our first ancestors fell prey to temptation, which led to sin, and the stain of sin became a part of who we are. Through the coming of Christ, we were given an opportunity. We could choose not to sin, and we try to do so. Each and every day, we try to do so. We try to make the right choices, to follow the path that the Lord has given us. And it's a path that Jesus summarized at the end of this chapter by saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. But it will not be until the resurrection, until the return of Jesus, until the culmination of the kingdom when all things are made new that we will truly be able to live as we were intended to do, to live without sin. Martin Luther described this cycle by saying that at creation, humanity had the choice to sin. Following Adam and Eve's fall, humanity had no choice but to sin. With the coming of Jesus, we have the choice to not sin. And at the resurrection, at the culmination of the kingdom, we will have no choice but to not sin. That's what this truly looks like for us. That's the goal to which we are striving. And that's also why Jesus' words to the Sadducees were so important. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But let's be honest, we're not there yet. That's not where we are. We're still in the moment when we have the choice to, sin, to not sin. We still live in this strange place of almost but not yet where we can see where one day we will be, but we fall short, which also affects how we interact with each other and with God. We say things that we wish we wouldn't have said. We do things that we know we shouldn't have done, and we don't speak up at times when we know that we should and quite frankly, we all, and this is probably appropriate on Father's Day, we all leave things undone that we know that we should. We miss the mark, which means that it's especially important for us to remember that in the context of this passage, Jesus is being asked about an aspect of marriage. And while the Sadducees were asking him about levirate marriage, we can learn much about how we should interact with each other and with God by remembering some other things about marriage. When I'm meeting with a couple to do premarital counseling, one of the little nuggets I often leave with them is that the three most important words in your marriage are not, I love you, but instead they are, I was wrong. <laughs> Many of you men are laughing because you know the truth of that statement. <laughs> we need to be willing to say it to our spouses, to our friends, to our family, even to those people who we might be a little frustrated with while we're driving somewhere in Atlanta. I was wrong. But even more, we need to be willing to say those words to our Creator. 
when we know that we've fallen short of God's desire for our lives, we should tell him that we were wrong. We should tell him that we are sorry. But there's another aspect of this passage that we have to remember. And it's the part of this passage that we'll sometimes not look at as much as what we've already talked about. There was already by this time a rather long history between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the contention between them, and a lot of that had to do with the fact and the idea of the resurrection. The Sadducees weren't willing to accept the concept, and it was one of the strongest held beliefs of the Pharisees. Now this challenge in the challenge in this contention between the two groups arose from how they would talk about the resurrection. I'd mentioned earlier that the Sadducees only took their theology from the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the Pharisees' view encompassed all of what we think of as the Old Testament. The Pentateuch, the prophets, the histories, and the works that we call the wisdom literature. And so the Pharisees would try to seek to prove the resurrection to the Sadducees, using mostly the words of the prophets. But since the Sadducees didn't accept those books as authentic, all of their words would fall short to the Sadducees. So the Sadducees were expecting Jesus to reply to them in a similar manner, probably quoting from Isaiah or Ezekiel, which made his response all the more jarring to them. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He's not God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus' response draws from Moses' interaction with the Lord right after God appeared to him in the burning bush. Jesus is replying with Exodus, reminding the Sadducees that God has never been God of the dead, but is always the God of the living. When he mentioned, when the Almighty refers to himself as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, these references are not to people who are long dead, but they are members of the resurrection of Israel. There are people who saw, whose presence was not history, but was part of the identity of the Jewish people, then and still today. But even more, it reminds us that God is alive. God is active. God is working towards something today that we know what is, even as we cannot always see it at work in our lives and in the world around us. He's working to bring about the moment when we will be in the place when the resurrection is not a hypothetical idea of something that will happen, but it will be happening for each of us. It's easy for us to lose sight of this fact. God desires that we will be there. He's working to make sure that it will happen, yet it will be in a time frame that we can't truly grasp right now. We know what it will look like in the broad brushstrokes of reality, and we know that it shall happen. But in the meantime, we aren't there yet. We still strive towards something greater, We look towards the resurrection. As many of you might have guessed, as the pastor for grand adults, I tend to officiate a good number of memorial services. And it's an honor to do so because this is a large part of what God has placed as a calling on my heart. And these are moments that are hard for us because we live in this moment where we grieve the loss of one who we have lost, even as we know the truth that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And so we have to find our way to understand what it means for us each in these moments when our hearts are torn asunder with a sense of loss that is greater than anything we ever expected. Even as our hearts rejoice knowing that the resurrection has occurred for those who we have said goodbye to. It's that strange place of almost but not yet. It's the most clear way that we can see what it is that Jesus wants us to know of the reality where we are. For we right now are on the cusp. We see what the future holds. We see the joy of the resurrection, even as we still sit on the fence of this life where our feet are dangling in the reality of almost but not yet. And while we're in this strange moment of time that has the fun theological term of inaugurated eschatology, we have to do something that is strange and hard for us. We have to learn to rest in the knowledge that God is with us, that God is at work, and that while we wait, we have the knowledge that the day will come when we too will be like angels in heaven. Please pray with me.
Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you give us words that challenge us, words that help us to understand you, and words that help us to understand what the future lay, that lies in store for us all. We ask that you will be with us, that you will comfort us as we are trying to decide to understand and to know you. Help us to see your face clearly and help us to dwell in the knowledge of the resurrection that one day all will be made well and all will be made new. In Christ's name we pray, amen.